Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Melissa Wasserstein, and I'm here to talk about uh, Screen Plus. Um, and Screen Plus is a phenotype first, biochemical phenotype first screening program. What I'll be focusing on are certain aspects of our program that are relevant to and hopefully collaborative with all of the other programs that are being discussed today. And that's specifically a focus on our infrastructure, including our consenting um, and our financial infrastructure, as well as an overview of our ethical, legal, and social implication studies. Here are my disclosures. As I'll share with you, Screen Plus is a multi-sponsored study. So this slide shows some of the industry partners and patient advocacy groups that are helping to support the program. So Screen Plus is a consented pilot newborn screening program that's being run in conjunction with the New York State Newborn Screening Program. Our goal is to enroll 175,000 babies born at nine high birth rate, ethnically diverse hospitals over a five year period. And the map on the right shows our hospitals and shows the um, anticipated number of births per hospital. So you can see these are really giant hospitals. And the overall goal is to assess the analytic and clinical validity of a multi-tiered screening for a fluid panel of disorders, as well as to assess the ethical, legal, and social issues um, from brief parental feedback surveys and interviews with parents of children. Our panel is shown here on the right. Um, there are 14 disorders on our initial panel. Importantly, it's fluid. So if there are disorders that are added to the RUSP or added to New York's routine screen, um, we can remove them or we can add additional disorders if they meet criteria. And we have very specific criteria for our panel, which include that we need to have a dried blood spot screening assay that's been validated, that's multiplexable, that's reasonably priced. Um, there have to be, you know, typical to some of the disorders, uh, and then the Wilson and Youngner criteria, significant morbidity or mortality if untreated. Many of these disorders are complex and have a wide range of phenotypic severity, so they all have to have at least a pediatric component to them. And importantly, we either have to have an FDA approved treatment or therapies that are currently in clinical trial. Our uh, panel is multi-tiered. So uh, we have a biochemical-based initial screen. It's typically enzyme-based, although it differs by disorder. Second tier is biomarker, and third tier is sequencing of the relevant gene. And we're really piloting how well that multi-tiered approach works um, with the goal of, of using these, this multi-tiered approach to enhance accuracy, to reduce false positives, Potentially even, is it possible to help predict phenotypic severity, which is always a huge question when you have a, a, a pre-symptomatic newborn in front of you and you, rain, you have a gamut of how severe that baby might be. If The more information, the better um, in terms of uh, prognostic and diagnostic evaluations. So Screen Plus includes longitudinal follow-up as part of the program. Um, I think that we all recognize that for new and complex disorders, capturing this long-term follow-up data is critical for, for two, two real big purposes. And one is feedback to the newborn screening laboratory. Did your prediction, did this screen positive actually have a phenotype? They need that feedback to assess the accuracy of their, of their assay. But also it's important when there, are, it's, you know, for the parents, if there's uncertainty about whether the child actually has the diagnosis or what that um, prognosis might look like long term. So you need to get that feedback for the parents as well as for the laboratory. And the only way to do that really is to do this longitudinal follow up and capture that data and share it both with the parents as well as the lab. We also need to know where's the, where our pilot program. Is there a benefit to early detection for these disorders? We like to assume the earlier you know, the earlier you treat, the better it is, but we really need to prove that that isn't actually the case. Um, and because we are a big program, we have follow-up that is embedded into the program. So follow-up for uh, screen-positive babies will be followed by Screen Plus clinicians, um, as well as some engaged disease-specific experts. And we are developing um, guidelines as to when to follow the babies, what to do, how frequently you should see them, and also guidelines about um, if and when they do need therapy. We're also offering family support um, to our parents who are 
um, dealing with a positive or an uncertain outcome. Um, we have patient advocacy groups um, that are engaged with our program um, and service community advisors. We also have supportive materials that they've provided to us that are ready to go. The second we have a positive baby, we can share them with the families. We'll be able to provide contacts to the families so they can reach out and speak to other parents. Um, and as part of our LC study, we actually have qualitative interviews with parents who've been uncertain uh, or have positive results. And in my own uh, experience with you know almost 20 years of seeing babies and families with newborn screening positive results, we. It's, it's clear that we always focus on the baby, but the parents are really struggling. Um, and I think we need to better understand what they're going through so that we can offer them better support. One of our community uh, partners, uh, the Cure MLD Foundation, actually has contributed to the program by donating the services of Dr. Al, who you see here, and he's on our website. So if we do have a baby who is positive, we can, if we can offer the parents uh, some discussions with Dr. Al, who himself is the parent of a child with a rare disorder. Um, that's not part of our program. We're not collecting any data. It's not research. It's just pure family support. If they need continued support, he can then help them connect with uh, providers. So let me now share information about how we're uh, getting uh, in informing our patients about what's going on. So we have, again, nine pilot hospitals, and we have a dedicated full-time site recruiter at each hospital who engages directly with each family. The conversations typically take, on average, 15 minutes. We um, are, have a verbal consent that's approved by the IRB, but we use a novel e-consent, script and brochure. If parents agree to participate, it automatically gets emailed to them so that they can refer back to it if and when they need to. Our study materials are currently translated into 10 languages, um, and you can see a few of them here. Um, and translation services are available uh, when need be. And these languages were chosen because they're the most common languages spoken at our hospitals. Again, I mentioned that we chose them for diversity. Um, and at the end of our consenting process, we offer a brief survey to parents to try to capture feedback on how we did. Was it enough? Was it not enough? Why did you choose to participate? Why did you choose not to? Um, and we're tracking every recruitment attempt through REDCap, and I'll show you more about that. So we launched right before COVID. It was quite fun. So this just shows our launch one. We actually had a recruiter uh, join us back in May. Uh, you see a little dip in recruitment when she took her MCAT, and then you see another dip when she decided that she was actually going to leave us and go on to medical school. So we had a 64% overall recruitment at that point at one hospital. We then had a little bit of lag until we found our next recruiter, who then started about four weeks before the rise of the Delta variant in the Bronx. And you can see that purple circle with the dotted line shows an 800% increase in COVID positivity in the Bronx um, as we were starting. So we really had to quickly pivot our recruitment because we were going one to one. We were going knocking on the doors, going in and chatting with moms. So we had a few different launch models, including a hybrid one where they would only go into the rooms of parents who were COVID negative and call the others by phone. Then we went into a fully remote where we would actually take our brochures. Eliza, our recruiter, would put a little sticky note on each brochure and said, hi, my name is Eliza. Congratulations. I'll call you. Um, and that was our fully remote method. And now we're in a hybrid two where the, uh, you know, we, it's a, kind of a combination in person for those who are COVID negative. But what we did learn was that despite these fast pivots to accommodate what was happening, we actually had a relatively stable consent despite all these different models. The key thing that was important and, and, and contiguous throughout all of those was this direct interaction, whether it was by phone or in person. I mentioned that we are getting parental feedback about our recruitment process. Um, so far, we have 203 parents that have given us information. Um, and one of the questions was, what was your main reason for participating in Screen Plus? And, and the majority said that their main reason was they wanted to learn about any conditions that their child might have. But second, and a close second, was that they wanted to participate for more altruistic purposes, was that they wanted to participate in research that might help other children. When we asked them what material was the most helpful to you to help make that decision, the vast majority in blue, 72%, said that it was those direct interactions and direct discussions with our coordinators, um, followed by the brochures and our website. Now, we have IRB approval to get 
information from people who decline to participate, but anybody who's done decliner surveys knows that once people say no, they often don't want to participate in the de decliner. So we don't have that much information from our decliners yet. But the little bit of information that we have, you know, we ask them, what was your main reason for not wanting to participate? And they could actually choose as many as they wanted to. But the primary reason was similar to everything, something that every, all of us are going to be facing is concerns about the baby's privacy. Um, and we were collecting information on demographics. We're trying to make sure that, or do whatever we can to make sure that our people who participate do represent the population and the demographics of the hospitals that we're recruiting from. And so far, it does seem to be uh, appropriate. We're also evaluating what does it take to actually get a child to consent into one of these studies? So we, like I said, we're capturing all of our recruitment efforts through REDCap. Um, and we're actually tracking time and efficiency. So on average, a consent was obtained about every 20 to 30 minutes at Weiler, which is the hospital in the Bronx, um, from May 2021 to March 2022. And the time cost of achieving every additional consented newborn was actually relatively robust, despite external stressors like COVID. Um, we didn't have any large fluctuations due to these changing models. But it's important that this model isn't just the time that was spent with our recruiter chatting with the parents. It actually takes into account every time that the recruiter knocked on the door and the nurse was chatting with the mom or the mom was taking a nap or every time that she tried to call and the phone was busy or it didn't pick up. It takes into account all of the effort that goes into recruiting. So next steps, um, we, are, we have just added on an opportunity for parents to, to consent passively as well in addition to our ongoing um, active consent methods. So you can see this is our one of our brochures, a Chinese brochure. You can see this little QR code at the bottom. This is available on the floor. It's available on all of the study materials that we have. Parents can just scan the QR code um, and they will be taken immediately to a short eligibility survey and e-consent form. And this way parents who are born when, uh, parents of babies who are born um, when our recruiters are on vacation, or if they just don't want to talk to somebody, they don't want to have somebody in the room, can still have access. Um, they can even actually use this just to ask to chat with one of our coordinators. Um, and we're also going to be putting all of these materials into some of the pediatric and OBGYN offices that are utilized by our pilot hospitals so that parents can actually even um, consent if they're not seen, or they can even consent before the baby's born. Um, we are about to pilot additional novel recruitment strategies using I heard one of the other, uh, I think it might have been you, Don, was talking about using uh, EHR. We'll be doing something similar. I'd love to chat with you about that. So our financial infrastructure, as I mentioned, we have a multi-stakeholder structure. We engage with our stakeholders early in the R01 submission process. It was actually part of our grant submission to NIH was that we were going to be modeling something like this. We have very specific stipulations with our industry partners, including that we will share only aggregate data. Again, we are not a sequencing-based study, so we're sharing results of the biochemical studies with them. The sponsors have no input on study design or interpretation of data. There's no identifiable patient information that will be shared. And therapeutic decisions, if a child does need treatment, will be made independently between the healthcare provider and the parents with no requirement to use any of these sponsor project, uh, products. And it's a complex structure, as you can see here. And I want to just give a shout out to my program manager, Nicole Kelly, who's sitting in the back, who largely helped design this. But most of the sponsors are helping directly with patient recruitment and patient testing, um, and including reagent costs. And the NIH is really supporting the coordinating center and our LC studies. You can see how complex it was on the slide before, and I think I just have to acknowledge that the contracting was so much more painful than I ever anticipated it being. It took a lot longer, especially we started contracting during COVID, and it was it just delayed everything. So gathering and managing this large group of incoming contracts and outgoing grants to all of our pilot hot projects, we actually have a a little team at Einstein um, that is just focused on Screen Plus managing this vast uh, project. So we did learn that establishing common guidelines, setting uh, common language in these research agreements was helpful and often did streamline things a little bit. So now about our LC studies. As we all know, we're on the cusp of a transformation in newborn screening practices. And I just threw up some um, of the 
highlighted uh, things that people might be seeing in the news. I think somebody had alluded to the little baby with the shirt on before, the issues with uh, access from law enforcement to dried blood spot retention. Um, how do we address these things? And I think that there's really a dearth of data right now pertaining to public and parental views uh, and values related to these changes. So it's really vital, I think we'll all agree, it's really vital to have input from key stakeholders, and those key stakeholders are parents, um, to help manage this expansion in a transparent manner and to maintain the ethical justification for what we all believe so firmly in. So we have a big LC component to Screen Plus. Um, we actually have access to thousands of parents. Remember, we have, we're have we going for 175,000 families. So far, 76% of our consented families have agreed to participate in our LC studies. So even with significant attrition, it's still gonna be a lot of parents who are engaged, who are from diverse backgrounds, who are willing to opine about, screen, about newborn screening. Um, we are gonna be sending them emails that will link them to the surveys. There are multiple languages. And I also wanna give a shout out to Aaron Goldenberg, who's here today, who's a co-investigator on the project and helping to design these studies. There's three big components to it. I showed you some of our consent feedback already, uh, quantitative parent surveys, which I'll show you on the next slide, as well as the qualitative interviews that I mentioned before. So we have multiple surveys that we're going to be sending out, and these are some of the samples of the kinds of things that we're asking about, starting with the hot topic, dried blood spot retention. We know what a lot of people think about it, but what do we, what do our parents really think about it? Um, do we need parental consent? If, when, how, what's the best way to get it? What kinds of disorders should be included on newborn screening expansion? Age of onset, is that something we need to think about? Treatability, diagnostic and prognostic uncertainty, whether it's from an expanded panel or a sequencing-based panel. And we also need to redefine the benefits of newborn screening. We always, the traditional focus has been on direct benefit to the baby. I think we can all kind of agree that there's lots of other things, avoiding the diagnostic odyssey, uh, reproductive planning, et cetera. But we need to ask parents, is this the right way to go? We need this input, we need this empiric data to help us guide forward in the future. And I'm gonna invite everybody, I'm hoping that this is an ongoing collaboration with everybody here. Um, we have this power, we have this large numbers of engaged diverse parents. If there's something that you think you'd like us to ask our parents about, we're happy to work with you and develop surveys so that we can all benefit from um, you know, knowing how to project forward um, in an ethically just manner. So in conclusion, most parents do want to participate in these, in these projects. We can try dynamic informed consent models, which can thrive despite external stressors. We do show that we can have a successful partnership between academia, government funding, and, and um, industry and patient advocacy groups, and that we do need to engage our parents as the key stakeholders to move this process forward. So a lot of acknowledgments, um, special shout out to my project managers, Nicole and Megan, who are sitting back there, a New York State Newborn Screening Program, Aaron Goldenberg, our scientific advisory board, a community advisory board, all of our sponsors, many of whom are here today. So thank you so much, and please reach out. <laughs>